have another another agenda. <laughs> uh, and, the, and, and the innocence of, of our young people. We are already, believe it or not, we are already in week six of Jonah. Uh, not another fish story, the summer series, which means summer is over, halfway over. Uh, school will be starting back, the fortune law. Uh, someone had mentioned to me the other day uh, that uh, as you get older, time seems to go by faster. Uh, and I didn't believe them until uh, now. Um, it seems like time is, is going uh, with one daughter fixing the head off to Texas and a son fixing to start high school. It does seem like time goes by faster. Um, as we began this story of Jonah, I have prayed that, that there would be a, a stirring or something going on in you if, if you've been listening week by week or, or in and out. And I, and I also hope for now that you realize that the story of Jonah is not about a fish at all. It's not even, it's about the character and characteristics of a God who created us, a God who loves us, a God who knows us intimately, and a God who deeply desires a relationship with us. And I pray you understand that God will go beyond the limits of anything that we can imagine to have a relationship with us. And when we reflect on the story of Jonah, we realize it's not always easy to see all people the way God sees them. And it's easy to say it. I mean, it's easy to, well, it's not easy to put it in a children's sermon, but it's easy for us to say that we need to love everyone the way God loves everyone, to see everyone the way God sees everyone. And it sounds good in a sermon, but it's really hard to love those people the way God does. And for Jonah, those people were the people of Nineveh. But you know those people and you know who those people are in your life as well. You see, the Ninevites in the story would rob and rape and murder every chance they got. And I cannot overstate that if there was anyone or any group of people on earth at that time justly deserved not to be loved or forgiven by God or anybody, it was the people of Nineveh. So today... We're going to do something a little bit different. While I am scatterbrained, you know, and sometimes I, I don't send in the wrong things, it is the exact same verse and scripture we read last week. It's not a mistake. Our scripture is the one, but I want to work backwards and read verse 10 and then kind of go back. Because last week we looked at it from a more personal viewpoint. And instead of preaching one long 40-minute sermon, I broke it up. And I want us today to look at the same scripture again, but corporately. Not individually, but corporately as a faith community. So we're going to start at the end of the scripture. We're going to work backwards to the beginning, if you will. So if you will, turn to the third chapter of Jonah, the book of Jonah, beginning with the 10th ten, ten, ten verse. When God saw what they did and how they returned and, and how they turned from their evil ways, God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Remember Jonah's eight words, <clears throat> repent. And when God saw this, the extent of the people of Nineveh's repentance, he didn't destroy it. It actually says that God changed his mind. God changed his mind. So that arises the question in some of us, does God change? The answer would be simply no. God doesn't change. God's character doesn't change. God's essence, God's divinity, God's authority, God's power Whatever characteristic you add to God, it does not change. And it doesn't change here either. It is consistent here as it is throughout all Scripture. But what you find here is God's reaction. 
of the people changed. The people repented. So God relented. And God gives us many chances, holding off judgment as long as possible. And as we talked about last week, God gives us the greatest gift of all, and that is time. Time. Time to change. Time to, time to respond. Time to do something different. Time for grace to flow. Time for hearts to change. God gives us time when we navigate through our own sea of life, if you will. And especially God gives us time when we live in a society and a culture that wants it fast and they want it now. And in the midst of the story, this question arises for me. I don't know if it does for you. But I wonder if all, as all this was going on, if, if Jonah felt love. I mean, did Jonah feel love? I mean, the question arises this very second to me right now. Do you feel love? And I mean, we hear about love all the time in, in music and in movies and relationships are all based on love. Do, do our young people know that they're loved? And the most famous Bible verse is God so what? Love the world. That he gave the, the priceless, precious piece of himself, the ultimate sacrifice any parent could give because he loves us. And then many times I, I admit, many times I look in the mirror and I don't look very lovable. I mean, honestly, I mean, there are moments when, when we are hard to love. And the people of Nineveh didn't believe in Jonah. They believed in God. And the moment they realized that they were loved by God, they fasted. I mean, they were not happy. They were not celebrating. They were not comfortable. They were an emotional wreck. And this whole city didn't just, not just a few people in this great city, at the time, everyone in the city, the most feared city at the time. And the king, the leader of this violent, feared city, the all-powerful, the greatest authoritarian anywhere, begins to take off his satin and his silk and puts on cloth, burlap that itches and cuts and, and puts ashes on his body. And we today don't get the significance here, but, but sackcloth and ashes were a visible sign of mourning, of being sorry, of being hurt, and a way to say to the world, look everyone, I am hurting here. I am suffering. It's a way that, that they show everyone that they are mourning in a time of mourning. As if when we are hurt, we might not shower. If we are in mourning, we might not take care of our, our basic hygiene needs. It's, it's the same thing. And in the midst of all this, we kind of forget sometimes. We forget that, that if you remember on day one when we started this, remember that they were a vicious city, that they crafted, if you will, fine-tune the art of war. We forget that, that, that before all this happened, the, the Ninevites were in the midst of this great battle, and, and they didn't believe in God. And in the midst of this, this great battle, as they're winning, as they're defeating, 
so that we will not perish. Were the people of Nineveh motivated to change by fear? Fear of the king? Fear of a god who could hide the sun and the moon? You bet. You bet. And I think that, that even in our own life, fears can be a great motivator for change. I mean, fear of dying and leaving our loved ones can, can make us change a, an unhealthy lifestyle into one that's, that's more geared to self-care and self-health. Even fear of divorce can, can motivate a couple to, to put more time and energy and intention in, into their relationship. I mean, the fear of blank, filling your own blank, can cause us to make positive, healthy changes in our life. Changes that both benefit us and, and those around us that we love. And remember, God is patient. God longs for a heart that is truly His. God searches for a heart that is completely His. So in the reflection of, of God's love, and the question that Jonah had to wrestle with, and that each of us wrestle, wrestle, uh, wrestle with is simple. Is your heart all God's? I mean, when it comes to this faith, when it comes to this Christianity following Jesus thing, is your heart all in? Or are you hanging on to some bitterness? I mean, some event that happened in a church years ago. Is there some event that happened to you, although it was not your own fault, where you were victimized and you just can't allow God's grace to penetrate? Have you built up walls somewhere, somehow in your life that you just won't? I'll go here, but I'm not going there. I'll come up to that. But I won't cross it, God. I won't give you all of everything I have, my whole heart, my whole love. You see, God loved the city. God's grace was enough for the Ninevites. Which brings me to my last question. Do you love our city? I mean, do you love our city? Do we, as a community of believers in Jesus Christ, we as a faith community, do we love our city? Do we pray for humility to see Centralia the way God sees Centralia? You see, when we begin to pray, God, let me see this city not as I see it, but as you see it. When we begin to say that simple prayer, God, let me see this city. God, let me see this community, not as I see it, but as you see it. When we begin to do that, we will begin to see things differently. And I know what you're thinking. Some of you are sitting there and saying, look, preacher smart pants, I have lived here all my life. You're still new, but oh, you've only been here seven years. You don't know. You're right. You're absolutely right. You see, I don't know what it used to be like. I don't know what this, this community used to be like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I have no idea. But I'm not asking you to love it in comparison to another time. I'm not asking you to look at it in comparison to another time. I'm asking you to pray that simple prayer and look at it in the present presence. At the present tent, at where you live, where you work, and where you play today. And if you do, you will begin to love our community the way God loves our community. From the richest, from the, from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor. From the best looking house and the best looking lawn on our, on our block to the worst looking house and worst looking lawn on our block. To the good, to the bad, from the pretty to the ugly. You will begin to love this community as God loves it. You begin to see it as God see it, sees it. But you must be willing to step out and let God do great things. You must be willing to step out and allow God to do great things, but we must be able to step out with grace and humility. We must be willing to let God shape our hearts to the end. We must be willing to love this community as God loves this community. And that is something that Jonah missed totally. And all that he went through. Was Jonah obedient to God? Yeah, the second chance he was. 
Was he obedient to his calling? Yeah, on the second chance he was obedient to his calling. But we will never know if Jonah was able to put aside his own hang-ups to love the people of Nineveh like God loved the people of Nineveh. We don't know if Jonah was able to look past the destruction, look past the pain, look past the suffering of these people that they had caused and really opened his heart up to them. We will never know. But we will know if we do. You see, we have an opportunity as a, as a faith community to embrace and love this city like never before. And we can love ourselves and our neighbors. Whoever they are. We can love our family enough to invite them here. We can love our children and our grandchildren who aren't in worship this morning anywhere to invite them here. We can love them enough to put them in the holy presence of God. And we can let them get, to, get connected to the love of Jesus Christ. And prayerfully, 